So I'd like to welcome everyone here tonight. My name is Janet Levitt. I'm the Dean of the University of Tulsa College of Law. It's so great to see um, so many familiar faces and recent graduates and students and friends um, here tonight for the seventh annual Seymour Lecture. Seventh. Um, and uh, just for those of you who haven't been to this lecture before, I really think it's one of its kind in the nation. This was a lecture endowed by um, Judge Seymour's law clerks and um, her family um, on the occasion of her um, taking senior status on the bench. Um, it was a true gesture of really just pure love and appreciation for the judge and all that she did to launch so many of our careers in, in the law. Um, and so uh, when, I, when I became dean, my husband, who always gives me unsolicited advice, told me, um, and he's not here so I can, I can say that, um, told me to never um, make any introductions about yourself and so I generally try to do that, but I'm going to break away from that just a bit tonight because as I was preparing for this evening, it felt like a real patchwork moment for me. And by that, I mean just sort of pieces of life that were being stitched together in a way that was, became all the more colorful and all the more beautiful. Um, one piece is um, the real privilege that I had in 19... 94 and 95 to be a, a law clerk for Judge Seymour, really a professional highlight. Judge Seymour has, uh, is a mentor and is actually one of my closest friends, even though her travel schedule means that we don't see each other very much, um, but has really been a guiding, a guiding light for me and my career and the way that um, I think about balancing my professional life and my family life. Uh, and then there's Kathy Coyle, who, um, particularly since I um, got this job seven years ago, has been a true friend and mentor. We have lunch about once a year, but phone conversations um, at different times about just sort of what happens in life and profession and, uh, I don't know, to you matters. Uh, Kathy's an alum of uh, TU, uh, a lawyer at Connor Winters, and so many of her colleagues are here, um, also a member of the Board of Trustees. Um, and so I really just appreciated those conversations. And she introduced me to her son, John, um, before he entered Yale Law School. Um, I think we had, I think that was, we had some conversations at, at Starbucks and I'm, blossom and flourish at, at Yale. Um, well, I mean, his, his accomplishments there were just amazing. And uh, we, we tried to hire him here <laughs> to join our faculty, um, but uh, he was hired and swept out from under us at the University of North Carolina. His career is um, just incredibly impressive, a JD from Yale, um, undergraduate degree from Harvard, studied at Oxford. Um, he uh, writes in the international law area, um, particularly some private international law, and, and so he and I have, have, he's taught me a lot in that area. Um, but tonight he is going to talk about um, some work that he's done um, on aqua hiring, and I looked at um, a lot of the pieces that have replayed that work in, in the popular press, um, you know, the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, Fortune, and um, I think that this work is just incredibly interesting. We're not in Silicon Valley here. Maybe it will be Silicon Prairie at some point. <laughs> um, but um, it's the kinds of issues that we don't think about every day, and so I'm really, it's really a true honor to uh, turn the podium over to John Cliff. Uh, thank you all so much for coming tonight. Um, thank you, Janet and CU College of Law for having me. Um, thank you, Judge Seymour, uh, for 
Being such an extraordinary judge that they endowed a lecture in your name to bring folks like me in to talk. I'm honored to be here. Um, thank you, Mom, for recruiting everybody to come and hear me. <laughs> <laughs> um, that was really wonderful and kind of you, and uh, I really appreciate it. So as this title, the title of this lecture indicates, um, I'm here to, I'm here to talk about the art of the aqua hire. And I suspect, and with good reason, many of you have never really come across this term before, which is entirely understandable. So let's begin with a definition. Right? What exactly am I going to mean when I talk about an aqua hire? An aqua hire is a, is a combination of two words. Um, an aqua hire occurs when there's a company that acquires a startup for the purpose of hiring its software engineer. So this happens a lot in Silicon Valley, where you'll have a situation where, say, Google will want to hire some more guys, right? And they're all guys. And they want to go off and hire them as their software engineers, and they can't find a, you know, anybody quite right just out of college. So they say, let's, let's go find some startups to see if there's any teams at these startups that seem like they're doing a pretty good job. They'll find a team that seems promising. They'll interview them and say, look, we're going to pitch this deal to you. We're going to acquire your company. And after we acquire it, we're going to shut it down. And when we shut it down, we're going to transfer you guys away from your company into the Google headquarters, and you're going to work for us on projects that we think are interesting and important, and hopefully you'll feel the same. So all these engineers sit around and they talk about it. They say, yeah, it sounds like a pretty good deal to us. We're going to go for it. And so Google acquires the company, shuts it down, and hires these guys into the Google mothership. Um, and that sounds pretty reasonable, right? Sounds pretty good, the way I've presented it to you. But if, if you think about it, this is actually kind of weird, right? <laughs> and the reason it's weird is because if you, most of the time when you're hiring people to come work for you, you're not also buying the company for which they currently work. Right? So this, I'm going to describe the ordinary scenario, the one you've probably seen before, as the classic poach. It's sort of in contradistinction to the aqua hire. In the classic poach, you have all these different actors. You have Google, which wants some engineers. You have a startup that has some engineers that work for it. The startup also has some other employees, you know, people who work in HR and marketing and things like that. They're not engineers, but they work there. And the startup will also have these investors who have put money into the startup, hoping it becomes the next big thing. Think about venture capitalists and the like. So ordinarily, right, not in the active hire scenario, but under ordinary circumstances, you would expect Google to go to the engineers and give them money. The engineers tend to their resignations and go to work for Google, and that's it. They hire away the engineers. That makes sense. Um, I suspect that many people in this room are familiar with the situation in the law where a group of partners and associates from one firm will go to work at another firm. That happens you know, a fair amount. And when that happens, the hiring firm doesn't then go and acquire the firm for which these partners and associates used to work. That would seem silly. <coughs> and yet that's exactly what happens here in the aqua. In the aqua hire, same group of actors, same people involved. But instead of Google just hiring away these engineers, Google also goes and it buys the startup. And when it buys a startup, the outcome of that is that money goes not just to the engineers, it also goes to the investors who invested in this business in the first place, and also to the other employees of the startup who get something, because most of the time when you join a company at the startup, you get some equity, compensation, they get some money from the, the acquisition. All right. So that's what happens, right, in an aqua hire. And the question is why? Why does Google prefer to do it as an aqua hire as opposed to doing it as a poach. It seems unnecessarily cumbersome. It's spending money on other people other than the engineers, which is the only group that this Google really cares about. Why does this happen? So I was working, I was thinking about this with a colleague of mine in North Carolina, and we came up with what we thought was a pretty darn convincing reason. And the reason we thought was, look, if these engineers leave the startup, they're gone, the startup is the engineers. Right, to be honest. Once these engineers go, the startup isn't going to go anywhere. It's going to fold. And once it folds, these other employees and these investors are not going to be very happy with the engineers who have just sort of run off in the dead of night to take a nice offer from Google. And there's a chance, not a certainty, but there's a chance that these investors especially may decide to bring a loss. Right? They might sue the engineers. They might sue Google. Who knows what? But maybe, just maybe, the aqua hire transaction structure is a defensive mechanism that basically kicks enough money over to these folks that they don't want to sue anybody after the engineers jump ship for Google. So my co-author and I, we wrote this paper together, we sat down and tried to figure out all the different possible causes of action that could be brought if, in fact, this was the goal of this, sort of preventing this litigation. So the first cause of action we thought of is 
a cause of action for breach of a covenant not to compete. Now, you all may know, many of you probably do, that a covenant not to compete is a very common contractual device that a company will enter into with its employees. And what it basically says is these employees can't leave the company and go work for somebody else for some length of time after they, you know, for some length of time, a year, two years, so on and so forth. And if they try and do that, they try and go work for a competitor during that non-compete period, well, their original employer has the right to seek an injunction from a judge to block them from doing it. So maybe, we thought to ourselves, maybe all these engineers have covenants not to compete with a startup. And if they just get poached away by Google, well, they'll be in breach of their covenant not to compete, they'll get sued, they'll be blocked, so maybe the act will hire as a way of sort of forestalling that entire litigation. They can go, everybody's happy, no harm, no foul. The problem with that particular thesis we discovered was that in California, sort of unusually, covenants not to compete are unenforceable in almost all cases. That if you want to go work for someone else in California, <coughs> covenant not to compete, if you sign one, doesn't make any difference. It's unenforceable under California law. So if that's the case, and if most of these deals are happening in Silicon Valley, it doesn't seem very likely that a desire to forestall litigation would be the cause of this, because there aren't going to be any enforceable agreements to enforce. Okay, but that's not where it stops. Maybe instead of having them sign a non-compete, there's this alternative doctrine of inevitable disclosure of trade secrets. Right? This is sort of like a, the same outcome as enforcing a non-compete but without a contract. The idea here is that if you are an employee, a valued employee, who has learned trade secrets in the course of working for one employer, and if another employer, a competitor, hires you away, the first employer can go and seek an injunction from a judge to block you from going to work for your new employer if they can convince the judge that in the course of working for your new employer, you will inevitably disclose trade secrets that you acquired while working for your original employer. Um, a recent case, of a, an interesting case in, in Pennsylvania, um, dealt with this. There was a fellow who worked for the company that manufactured Thomas English Muffins. Mm -hmm. All of you may know about Thomas English Muffins. They have a very distinctive texture. The, the nooks and crannies, right? <laughs> <laughs> you put butter on them, it's steep and cranny. It's delicious. They're fantastic. <laughs> Well, as it turns out, there was a fellow, one of the seven people in the world, who knew how to do the nooks and crannies. <laughs> Hostess calls him up and says, we want you to come work for us in our English muffin business. <laughs> what do you say? And the guy says, sounds great. So he goes off to work for Hostess, and shortly thereafter, his old employer goes to a judge and says, you have to stop him. You can't let him work for Hostess, because if he does, he, might, he will inevitably disclose certain things, perhaps the nooks and crannies secret that he learned while working for us. You have to block him from doing this. And the judge says, you're right. And he blocked this guy from working for a hostess. He couldn't do that because he would inevitably disclose trade secrets. That sounds pretty good. Maybe that's what's going on here. But the aqua hire, unfortunately, had this great theory. It didn't work out. California has squarely rejected this doctrine as well. So that's not it. All right. Tortious interference with the contractual relationship. Maybe these engineers have contracts with the startup and by poaching them away, Google is interfering with that contractual relationship. That's no good. These engineers don't sign contracts with the startup. Breach of fiduciary duty, maybe, sort of a stretch. Misappropriation of trade secrets, even more of a stretch. Unfair competition, so the last resort of any litigator to try and unfair competition, that's probably not going anywhere. And so our theory crashed down around our ears. It seemed pretty clear to us that aqua hiring was not being done as a means of preventing <coughs> potential litigation. Here's our problem. The causes of action we've identified aren't any good, and the more we talked to actual real life people out in Silicon Valley, the more we were told that even if a viable cause of action existed, nobody sues each other in Silicon Valley, save for really extreme cases like outright theft and outright fraud. Right? If you've stolen something or you've defrauded somebody, yes, you'll get sued. Otherwise, investors don't sue startups or the entrepreneurs who start them or people who do that generally. All right, so we struck out. That was a terrible idea, right? That, that did not explain the phenomenon at all. So we regrouped and came up with another possibility that could potentially explain the somewhat unusual transaction structure. And this focused less on formal legal rules and the threat of lawsuits and more on social norms, right? So the idea here behind a social norm is that they say, reading this here, in close-knit communities where people interact with each other frequently and information flows freely, people may adhere to social norms of cooperation because it is in their long-term interest to do so. All right, that sounds pretty good, but what exactly does that mean? Right? What are some examples of real-life scenarios where these social norms seem to influence people's behavior and constrain the way they act? Well, we sort of 
doing some research, and we came across a number of three articles that I'm going to briefly talk to you about. The first involves a famous study by a guy named Stuart McCauley, who is still a professor at the University of Wisconsin Law School, involving surveys of Wisconsin businessmen in the early 1960s. And what he found in interviewing these guys was that they almost never sued each other. You know, they were extremely unusual for lawsuits to be brought. And that by and large, almost every dispute was settled outside of the legal system. And why? Why did they not do these legal rules? Well, for two reasons. Um, the most important one is that they, there was an enormous value placed on one's reputation in this particular business community, right? No one wanted to be known as the guy who had welshed on a deal, didn't honor his commitments. So there was extreme pressure, not from the law, but just from the people you interacted with in your business community, at your country club, at your church, all those places, not to you know, not to break your word, not to honor your contractual commitment. And that, Macaulay found, played an extraordinarily important role in keeping people honest and making sure these disputes never really got all that serious. If they ever did get serious, there was a threat of blacklist, right? Well, that guy, that guy doesn't pay his bills, that guy doesn't honor his commitments, we're not going to do business with him anymore. And that, again, was a sanction that carried some weight and really deterred people from engaging in bad behavior. So here we have a world where legal rules are out there, and as a last resort, you can obviously sue your, contract, your contracting partner, but as a matter of day-to-day -day business, that doesn't really seem to be affecting the way they interact. It's much more social norms, reputation, threat of exclusion that really is driving this. All right, so that's one example. Example number two. Um, in 1980, a law professor at Yale, a guy named Robert Ellickson, went up to Shannon, California, which is a very rural part of California, um, north of San Francisco. And he interviewed a bunch of ranchers and a bunch of farmers. And the question he was trying to figure out was, so there's a famous you know, dispute in the law, and it sort of goes to this, is if you have cattle, and if you have farms that are in close proximity to each other, is it the legal obligation of the ranchers to fence the cattle in, so they don't eat the crops, or is it the legal obligation of the farmers to fence the cattle out? Well, you can sort of see a case for either way, right? So he goes up there and he starts interviewing ranchers and farmers and trying to figure out, well, what's the rule, right? Well, how does this work? What, what do you guys know about this? And what he found was that he figured out what the rule was, but he also found that the people who were actually out there had no idea what the rule was, and it didn't matter. <laughs> These folks didn't matter. The law said about who's responsible to fence in, fence out, it made no difference at all. That as a practical matter, the ranchers and farmers of Shasta County had evolved a completely idiosyncratic system of dealing with disputes that have nothing to do with formal legal rules or lawyers or anything of that sort. That when a trespass occurred, when a cow went onto the land and ate the, ate the crops, there would be some sort of informal balancing system, right? The rancher would help the farmer build a fence, right? Or there'd be some credit carried forward in some mental ledger, oh, he owes me a favor because his cow ate my crops. And that's how it was dealt with for the most part, right? They weren't going to court. And occasionally, when this initial you know, balancing didn't work out very well, there were sort of slightly more uh, drastic remedies. They would gossip about each other, right? Mm -hmm. Tell bad things. These people gossip like crazy, by the way. They have nothing else to do out there. They just gossip all the time. So no one really wanted to be the guy everybody thought, thought poorly of. Um, sometimes, the farmers, this happened several times, the farmers would take the cattle, herd them to the most inconvenient location possible, then call the rancher and say, you can go pick them up, right? So sort of self-help remedies of that sort. <laughs> and occasionally, if this happened over and over again, the farmer would say, look, if I see your cow on my land again, I'm going to kill it. Right? It's not allowed. That's actually against the law. But it was widely recognized as a justifiable thing to do if a rancher just couldn't keep his livestock under control. And that also seemed to have some effect at monitoring. The point of all this is that none of these guys are going to court. None of these guys are calling lawyers. None of these things are lawsuits being brought in accordance with the legal rules that were in effect. Again, they didn't care about the legal rules. There was a completely different set of norms that governed why they acted the way they did. Last example, <coughs> diamond merchants in New York. So you may not know this, but about 80% of the diamonds, the raw diamonds that come into the United States, come in through New York, and they're dealt with through a club of diamond merchants known as the New York Diamond Dealers Club. Over time, these merchants involved in a series of social norms governing contracts they enter to between themselves, and these were eventually codified to a set of rules that all members of the club had to follow. Now, once they actually got these rules down, um, these folks never, they never go to court. If there's a dispute, it is referred to mandatory arbitration within the club. 
The decision is handed down, and if you don't comply with the decision, you're excluded from the club, you have no access to diamonds, you're basically, you've lost your livelihood. So this is an extreme example of this, where these particular, this particular merchant community never goes to court. They do not rely on any sort of external rules at all. They have an internal set of rules that determine who's who and what's what, and what rights people have vis-a-vis -vis one another when they breach their agreement. All right. So when we talk about social norms, that's what we're talking about. But the trick here, and sort of maybe you think, well, does this really work for Silicon Valley? It's because most of the time you think about reputation and social norms really matter when you have you know, close-knit communities, geographically concentrated homogenous groups, repeated transactions. Is that really characteristic of Silicon Valley? You know, it's sort of, sort of true in Wisconsin. It's definitely true in Shasta County, with the ranchers and the farmers, and it's definitely true for the diamond merchants. Is it true in Silicon Valley? And the answer is probably not. But, in the interim, you develop technological innovations that allow information to spread very quickly about people's bad behavior. So if you're in a reputation market, the wired up community of Silicon Valley is great for spreading news about people who do not honor their commitments, who are not trustworthy. And that, I think, sort of acts as a substitute that means that reputation can matter, social norms can impact behavior. In All right, so back to the aqua. So maybe the reason they're structuring the transaction in this way has nothing to do with legal rules, as we customarily understand them as lawyers. It has everything to do with unique norms that have evolved in Silicon Valley over time. So, to figure this out, let's start with the engineers. Right? They're sort of the heroes of the story. What are their intents? Well, let's talk about first the engineers deal with these investors. Right? The engineers are often the entrepreneurs. They're the guys who went out and raised the money from the investors in the first place. The investors believe in the engineers. They're sending money into their project. If the engineers were to depart for Google in the dead of night, saying, sorry guys, we're out of here, I think it's safe to say the investors would be unhappy. Now, the investors wouldn't bring a lawsuit. That's not what they do. What they do is they keep a list, and they tell their friends. Right? They tell their friends such that these particular engineers, if they were ever to try and raise money again to start a new business later on, after they left Google, after the couple of years were up, they would find it very tough going. Right? They were the guys who had abandoned their investors the first time around. They don't want to be those guys. Therefore, this time around, they are happy to kick a little bit of money over to the investors so the investors maintain their good impression of them and will recommend them to their other friends who are investors if they ever want to start another business. In addition, we have these other employees. These other employees are people who believe in the engineers. They believe in these guys. They sacrificed other opportunities to go work for this particular startup because they thought these guys had it made. Again, if you leave for Google in the dead of night, that's a fairly shady thing to do. This is a purely sort of you know, friendship, moral thing to do. By structuring this as an aqua hire, you don't leave these other employees without anything. They typically get some money, it's not great, but it's something, and it really makes you look a whole lot better in their eyes, and you probably feel a whole lot less guilty about snatching up this sweet offer. All right, so those are things that the engineers may want to do these deals because they will avoid incurring reputational harm by just jumping ship. But there are also reputational benefits, most common of which is if you do this deal as an aqua hire, and you're an engineer, you can walk into a bar and casually mention to your friends, I sold my company to Google last night. Right? <laughs> and that carries a lot of weight. People are really impressed when you tell them you sold your company to Google. They think you're a pretty awesome guy. And that story says a whole lot better than saying, yeah, I left my company for Google. I left the investors high and dry. Those other employees, I left them alone. That story doesn't play so well when you're out with your friends at a bar in Silicon Valley, so you can actually increase your social cachet, you can increase your, your, you know, your reputation by selling your company as opposed to just jumping for a better offer. <clears throat> now, one last thing to mention here is that a lot of these engineers, these aren't guys who are doing this over and over and over again. A lot of these times these startups are you know, newly minted Stanford <coughs> engineering grads who had an idea to have this business. They don't know the ways of the world yet, right? They haven't really thought about this very much, but they're advised by lawyers. And these lawyers do these deals all the time. So to the extent the engineers have missed the implications of having to deal with these investors in the future, or really making <laughs> the other employees quite upset, or fail to appreciate that being able to tell people you sold your company to Google is a cool story to tell, the lawyers will clue them in. The lawyers will help tune them into the fact that this actually, this matters. In the long run, you want to be able to tell people these things, you want to maintain your reputation in this community, and they actually help make sure that these engineers play by the rules and make sure that they don't make obvious mistakes. 
All right, so this social norm story really seems to work reasonably well when it comes to explaining why the engineers kind of like these act wires, right? Why they're willing to do them, why they're willing to kick over a little bit of money over these other groups when they don't necessarily have them. Let's talk about the bias, right? Why might Google prefer to do an aqua hire as opposed to just hiring away these engineers? Well, there's this notion of a startup ecosystem in Silicon Valley. And this basically what this boils down to is that Silicon Valley is one of those places where it's fairly unusual in that there's lots of people who have an idea for a business, lots of tech innovators, and there's also a lot of money, a lot of um, you know, venture capital and angel investors, and there's money sloshing around the valley. And that's good for business, generally, for all the companies in the valley, including Google. Right? Google likes all these businesses being close by, it helps keep them in the loop, they, they can acquire them, I think they're really great ideas, and it means that teams of entrepreneurs and teams of engineers will come together who Google can snatch up. If Google made it a policy of just hiring these guys away and not giving any money to the investors that sank money into these startups, they might be killing the golden goose. Right? They want these investors to keep doing these things because then they can keep poaching them away or sort of keep buying their companies. So by doing it as an aqua hire, the investors get something and that subsidizes future investment in future startups in Silicon Valley. So that's a good reason for Google to keep doing it. Um, there's this old rule that you can't ever earn more money than your boss is making, right? So that's sort of a cap. If your boss is making $50,000 a year, you can't get paid more than that. Your boss won't go for that. So when these engineers, the guys who are presumably pretty talented, are brought into the Google mothership and put to work on Google projects, their salary is going to be capped. They can't get paid more than their boss. Um, but doing this as an aqua hire allows them to effectively be paid more because just as you can, uh, rather than paying them in the salary, and the sort of the, the line going straight down from Google to the engineers in terms of <coughs> compensation, you can structure it so that the money coming to the engineers from the startup is quite sizable. So that's like a one-time bonus, if you will, that effectively allows them to pay these guys more than people they're working with or more than their boss, which helps keep them happy and helps Google keep the uh, salary structure intact. So that's maybe another reason why Google kind of likes these aqua hires. It allows them to get more money to these guys they really want to hold on to. Another sort of unusual, but sort of makes sense to me think about it idea. So um, Google, the people at Google who handle these deals are called the corporate development guys. They go out and meet with the entrepreneurs, meet with the engineers, try and convince them to come work for Google, do these aqua hires. But the thing is, the corporate development guys at Google, they kind of don't want to do that forever. What they really would kind of like to be doing is working at the venture capitalists, right? Because these venture capitalists, if you want to make more money than anybody, the VCs are where to go, right? Google corporate development, earn a good living, you're going to be all right. The VCs, you know, untold riches await. So there's this weird sort of perverse incentive from the fact on the part of these Google corporate development guys to keep the investors happy in these deals because it preserves their good relations on a personal level, not with the company, but the personal level with these with these investors, so that someday if the VC is looking to hire, well maybe the guys from Google corporate development get the leg in, the leg up to get into that job. Right? So it's sort of a not necessarily good for Google, but maybe it's good for certain employees of Google who want to go do this. And finally, when we mentioned covenants not to compete earlier, um, one of the few situations where you can enforce a covenant not to compete in California is if you sell your business to somebody else. So if Google acquires a particular startup, that's the act of the sale of business. Thereafter, Google can insist that the employees who come to work for it from the um, startup sign enforceable covenants not to compete, which allow Google to keep them locked up for a period of time after they leave Google. Again, it's not the primary reason why these deals seem to happen, but it certainly is a nice add-on. All right, what about the investors? What do the investors get out of? Well, to be honest, the investors don't get very much out of it. Well, they actually, to be, to be very clear, the investors will always prefer an aqua hire to a poach. Why? Because in an aqua hire, the investors get something. They get money because they get bought out. In a poach, they get nothing. So you don't really need to explain <laughs> why the investors prefer the aqua hire. It's sort of a priori true. They, of course they want that. They get money in that scenario. But, Another reason why the investors don't mind this so much is that the investors, <clears throat> they're typically venture capital funds, often. In venture capital funds, what they do is they'll raise one fund, they'll go out, they'll invest in a whole bunch of small startups, hope one of them hits it big. But most, most funds, you know, they've got one fund going, but they're also going out and raising money for the next fund, right? So they're trying to raise money for future funds. And when they're raising money for future funds, they have a scorecard. And the scorecard is they show their potential investors and say, hey, look, in our last fund, we had three companies that were home runs. 
you know, three or four companies that were exits in the sense they did okay but didn't take off, and ten that were busts. An actual hire counts as sort of a, as an exit, right? So it's in the intermediate category, not a huge success, but not a huge failure either. So if you can classify this company that was otherwise perhaps going to go under, wasn't going to last very long, you shift it from the bust category into the exit category, then well, hey, the venture, the, the venture capitalists like that, it improves their scorecard, and again gives them one more reason to think, hey, we kind of like this transaction stream. So if you walk through it like that, right, so start thinking about the actual hire in that sense, it all sort of starts to make a little bit more sense than if you're looking at it purely through the lens of, of legal rules. The engineers like it because they stay on good terms with their co-venturers in the startup, the investors, and the other employees. The engineers also perhaps make a little bit more money than they would otherwise going direct to Google, which is good for them. Um, Google likes it because it preserves its whole startup ecosystem and makes sure that more money will flow into future startups. Um, Google also likes it because it you know, has a salary differential and for other reasons. And so everybody sort of comes out ahead. Right? These, 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 these advantages you get from doing it this way, really, you know, there's really no reason not to do it. Unless you're an engineer that's extremely greedy, doesn't really care about your reputation, just wants to get the money and run, in that case, okay, fine. You know, you can, you can do it that way. But for the most part, for most people in Silicon Valley, that's not how they think. They think he's going to be doing this multiple times, it's a repeat game. And because it's a repeat game, you're going to stay on good terms, and therefore you get this particular transaction structure. All right, takeaway. Right? Okay. So in law school, um, we're trained to think about things in terms of legal rules and in terms of losses you can bring. Most law school exams are, here's a long fact pattern, what claims might you bring as against certain actors? Right? That's just the way we're trained, and there's a lot of lots to recommend to that. But this training can get us into trouble because there are scenarios where these lawsuits don't really get us very far. It doesn't help us explain what's really going on. Also, Transaction structures can be driven by a variety of factors, including some that have nothing to do with the actual law. Um, and in fact, as we have here, certain transaction structures are inexplicable. You cannot explain why it's done this way solely by reference to the law. Um, you have to look somewhere else to figure it out. Here, we think social norms go a long way towards explaining that, but you know, other things could also explain it in other scenarios. So that's the act why. That's why we see these things being done. Um, so after I worked on this paper, <clears throat> had a couple of interesting email exchanges. Um, one person wrote to me to say that they had heard of a deal involving SeaWorld and another marine aquarium type thing, in which SeaWorld acquired this other marine aquarium solely for the purpose of getting the whales. Right? <laughs> they were aqua hiring the whales. And after <laughs> the deal was done, they shut down the marine aquarium number two and moved the whales to SeaWorld, and that was how it was. Right? I don't think this is technically an aqua hire because I don't think the, the, the whales would count as employees, right? But it's a very interesting example of how this is going to work. Um, and one other thing I'll mention in closing, and I'll be happy to take your questions, is that, you know, is this transaction structure really limited to Silicon Valley? And I think in some ways it should be because this whole reputational structure really only works if you have a fairly concentrated community, you know, even if there's technology helping to facilitate, you get too far afield, it just doesn't work very well. But once this transaction structure was pioneered in Silicon Valley, you start seeing it pop up in other places. As people were just borrowing the model and using it elsewhere. Weirdly for me, over Christmas dinner two years ago, my father-in-law says, oh yeah, I'm actual hiring a company right now. And I'm like, you live in Dallas. Like, what are you doing? How have you even heard this term? It was very strange. Um, he was actual hiring a company up in Canada. I was like, all right, kind of weird, but okay. Um, and so it seems as though, while well, the actual hire originated in Silicon Valley, it has now spread to other parts of the United States because they're borrowing the model. It seems to work there. Why not try it somewhere else? So hopefully, you know a little bit more about this deal structure than you did when you came in. Um, if there are any questions, I would be delighted to take them. Yeah. Sounds, sounds like there's a, a lot of uh, pros on this. Uh, it sounds very good. I'm wondering what, if any, would be any cons or any sort of possible drawbacks if there is any. Uh, can you let us know about that? Um, any downsides to doing things as an aqua hire? Um, the only downside from the perspective of, say, Google, is that Google doesn't really want to kick off all this money to people that it's not hiring. So it's giving these other employees that it doesn't want to hire, it's giving them some money. It's giving these investors some money, which maybe helps it in the sense it preserves its startup, startup ecosystem, but really, Google, maybe it cares, maybe it doesn't. 
that the downside for Google is it would prefer that all the money it's spending on this transaction go to incentivize these engineers that it wants to hire, but, you know, so a con, well, it's sort of a downside potentially to Google, and if the engineers are strongly in favor of doing this as an actual hire, it's hard for Google to say no, right? So there's really no downside per se, although certain actors may have stronger or weaker preferences for structuring it. Yeah. John, uh, welcome back to Tulsa. Thank you. Uh, as a, uh, 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 an informal norms scholar, I'm very interested, a little disappointed that that wasn't the total answer that, that you found to the, the, the project, but a piece of it. As an IP scholar, I'm wondering if a legal rules dimension isn't uh, maybe lurking here somewhere. Maybe you've discovered it, uh, or maybe it just doesn't apply. I'm not saying you're right about it. But if you, if you aqua hire, uh, mm -hmm. you're both hiring the engineers, mm -hmm. and you're, you're also acquiring the intellectual property right. of, the, of the company that they have created. That is to say, the patents they've generated, the software copyrights, and the trade secrets. Yep. If those are valuable to Google, it seems to me that you get a, a synergistic kind of uh, acquisition where you get both the creators who, of course, themselves have parted with those rights under work for hire or, mm -hmm. agree, uh, or, or, or assignment contracts with the startup, but now you get both what they created and the creators, and so you get an ongoing relationship between property and their creators such that improved patents, derivative work software, uh, preserved and enhanced trade secrets are in prospect. Is, is that a dimension? That, that is a, it's a terrific question. And what I'll say is, um, so for the most part, the companies that are deemed to have been aqua hired, uh, it's almost taken as a given that they had no particularly valuable intellectual property that Google was interested in getting, right? If they did have such intellectual property, it would probably put a different label on the transaction, right? So if they had some valuable IP, some code, something like that, that would be a straight acquisition, right? They're acquiring the company both for the people and for the IP. So I think almost as a a priori thing, and I didn't make this clear at the beginning and I should have, that these transactions, it's almost assumed that the IP is worth it, right? It's not particularly valuable, Google doesn't really want it, but if it were just the IP, Google wouldn't do it, right? In fact, it's almost zero. They really want the people. So a lot of times you'll see that Google will actually acquire these, these companies, and then it will actually sort of solely for the purpose of keeping the IP out of the hands of somebody else, that it won't ever use it, right? It's like, okay, defensively we'll take it, we'll stick it away in a drawer somewhere, we'll just forget about it, we're not going to use it for anything, right? Um, first answer, so the slightly more detailed answer is that a lot of the time the IP here, you know, patents, most of these startups here, they're just internet companies, they don't really have any patentable material, right? It's sort of code, and sort of an idea for like how to do a new app for the iPhone or something like that. So patents don't really come into it. Trademarks, again, they don't really have any marks worth anything. Trade secrets, again, they're sort of internet companies, so not so much. So really it's copyright you'd be dealing with here. And copyright, occasionally these things are valuable, but again, it's hard to copyright code, you know, sort of depends on where you are. Um, so for the most part, well, intellectual property can absolutely play a role in all these things. In most of the deals that I'm sort of concerned with, it's of marginal to negligible value. Yeah. Well, then the, 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 the seems to raise the question, right, what are the signals that Google uh, receives to identify the engineers yeah that wants to hire, right? Because it, presumably one of the reasons it wants to hire, buy the company is not just for the particular engineers, but for the team, yep. right? And so the, the, there's value in the, the team, yep. but if there's no intellectual property that they either want to keep out of the hands of others or use for their own purposes, then what are the signals that Google has to identify who is a likely aqua hire? So it's, it's a great question. There are various ways in which these sort of deals bubble up and come to fruition. Right. On the one hand, corporate development guys at Google are out sort of scouting the valley, figuring out who's doing what. Maybe they have a good, good potential actual hire. Sometimes startups will be struggling. They have a very hard time getting traction. They're running out of money. And the team will realize they don't have any valuable IP. So they actually pitch themselves to Google or to Facebook or to another big company saying, hey, why don't you aqua hire us? <laughs> right? um, in other cases, uh, venture capitalists, they have, they'll do the same thing. Right? They'll know one of their investments in these startups is struggling. They kind of want an exit rather than a bust on their scorecard, so they actually pitch the deal to a Google or Facebook. And sometimes it's the lawyers, right? The lawyers know about this. The lawyers have friends everywhere. The lawyers love to know about this. So um, these deals can come about in many different ways, right? Sometimes it's the engineers, sometimes it's the lawyers, sometimes it's the, the, the Google corporate development people, sometimes it's the uh, VCs. They all can do these, and they happen in all kinds of weird combinations of ways. Um, so in terms of how they happen, well, it's mixed. But you're right that somebody initiates these transactions, and sometimes they work and sometimes they don't. 
right? But in terms of the team aspect, you're exactly right. You're doing these things as a team, right? You get these synergies, you get these people coming together, and that's a huge advantage. But at the end of the day, it's not clear that you need to do the deal as an aqua hire to keep the team. So you poach away the whole team, right? I mean, lawyers and associates do this all the time. Like a group of like five partners and six associates all leave, and hey, that's a team, but they haven't been bought out either. You know, so you don't have to do it quite that way. Yeah, do you have a question? Um, well, so you know, going back to like the diamond merchants or or Shasta County, or, um, you know, the social norms work because these are closed clubs. And certain people know the norms, and certain people don't know the norms. And even yourself sort of referred to sort of a certain exclusive. I think I heard you say, like, you know, all these engineers are, are men. They are all are. I mean, yeah. so, so the the, the concern, um, and then sort of your point about the attorneys instilling social norms also, I think, is is sort of interesting. I'd love to hear you flesh out more because the concern is. So if social norms are the glue that glues us all together, sort of what happens to the sort of person who is outside of the club or the group of people who are outside of the club or who did not graduate from Stanford um, and who might not have connection with the lawyers who are, who are instilling the social norms. So, I mean, I think, uh, uh, you know, in some way, I think this explains what's going on really well. And there's there's part of me that says, well, sort of, I want the law to come in at some <laughs> point because that's more transparent, that's more open, that's more inclusive, that's more democratic. I don't know. It's, I'm, I'm not exactly sure what my question is, but that's clearly a concern about how this all operates. I would agree with that. I, I, would, I would actually say that not only is that a concern at the aqua hire phase, yeah. it's a concern at the initial funding phase. Cause Go back a step. When the startup is first trying to raise capital to actually get the idea off the ground, the kids who went to Stanford and have engineering degrees have a huge leg up over the kids who didn't go to Stanford and earn engineering degrees and have all these networks, right? So I think that the world of Silicon Valley, on the one hand, it's a meritocracy in the sense that if you are a truly insanely gifted computer programmer who has an idea that's going to change the world, you can come into town and you can change the world. You can do that, make that happen. If you're not that once-a-generation guy or girl, but you're going to be all guys. Um, they're sort of in the middle of the pack. The people from the middle of the pack from Stanford and Berkeley and some other sort of places like that, we have these social capitals, these networks, are going to have a leg up at every stage in the process. Right? It's going to be true, you know, whether the legal rules kick in, whether they don't. Right? I agree with you that this seems sort of unfair and not quite right that people without these things don't have the leg up, but you know, I, I think that the project is less about articulating the world as I wish it would be, but more just think this is the way it actually is. So just so, I mean, yeah. those engineers then go into Google and become the people who are ultimate, and rise up Google and become the people who are ultimately replicating the process. So it's sort of all... Self-perpetuating hierarchy, yeah. that's right. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> but it's economically dysfunctional to engage lawyers. So that's... Say more about that. It costs a hell of a lot of money, and it goes back, I don't know when it quit, but in the 70s and maybe the early 80s, you had a widespread social norms in the oil and gas business uh, that was very gentlemanly, and you never know when you're going to meet the other guy coming down the road the other way. So you didn't push things, kind of like the farmers, but it was widespread throughout the, the industry. So. I think it's fair to say that when, when there's a lot of money going around for everybody to get rich, you know, I think that... People, it's easy to be nice to people. I think that it's probably true of the oil and gas industry in the 70s. It's probably true of Silicon Valley right now. That you know, when everybody's doing very well, it's easy to sort of be gentlemanly. I think that when the crunch hits, that's when maybe the knives come out a little bit more. But it's, it's a nice analogy. <laughs> um, yeah. I'm curious. Time. The do you find investors going forward knowing about this aqua hire system trying to mitigate their return on their investment by trying to get contractual protection from their lawyers on the front end to make sure that if their startup doesn't blow up on its own, that they still get the aqua hire on the back end. Yes. You know what I mean? So the, the entire, so the, the advent of the aqua hire has changed the way people plan these transactions from the get-go. So just to take a quick step, we'll get to the uh, investors in just a minute, but from the, for the uh, entrepreneurs, when they're launching these businesses now, 
one of the exit options they're thinking about is an act lock. Right? So if you're starting a startup, thinking, well, okay, what could happen? I could go public. Okay, I could get bought out by a big company in a real acquisition. Or hey, if I get act well hired, right? I actually talk to a guy who started a startup with this option explicitly in his mind, which wouldn't have been true five years ago, because deals weren't happening this way five years ago. So yes, change the planning me mechanisms for the, for the en engineers. And for the investors, the investors are aware of this, and it drives them crazy, right? This drives the investors nuts, because they get all the trouble of finding these promising startups. And they fund them, and they give them advice, and give them industry contacts, and make all this work, all for these thin guys to say, thank you very much, we're going to work for Google, we're not going to take this startup public, we're not going to give you a huge return on your investment. It drives the investors crazy. Um, so, what can the investors do? Well, can they somehow contractually protect themselves? And the answer is they can, but only to a certain extent. So what they can do is they can negotiate like a liquidation preference that when the company gets sold, they'll get twice their initial investment back, or three times their initial investment back if they're very aggressive. So that's like their consolation prize. They put a million dollars in, they get two million dollars out. That wasn't what they wanted. They wanted to get two hundred million dollars out, but getting two million dollars is getting better than getting nothing. Right? So they can negotiate for that up front, and that's a fairly common contractual provision you'll see. The danger for the investors is if they push too hard, if they ask for too much, guess what happens? The engineers say, we don't have to do this at all. We're going to poach. We'll see you later. We're gone. So the investors can push to, get, to improve their return to a certain point. If they push too hard, there's always the risk the engineers who kind of are in control of this process say, we're just going to leave. We're not going to do anything. Yeah. Um, but, so in that case, the liquidation preference never gets triggered though, right? Because the engineers just go to it's Google and the, and the company. Correct. That's, that's why the investors, yeah. that's why their contractual protection is, is worthless at that point, because the liquidation preference only kicks in if the company is acquired, so if they just leave, that that, protect, that contractual protection becomes useful. Right. Yeah. So I'm wondering also, um, I'm not a tax lawyer at all, but I'm a former M&A lawyer. What about, could there be some tax logic to in these deals, like net operating loss carry forward? There is. So, um, so my co-author on this paper, this paper is a tax lawyer. Oh, okay. He's extremely good. He knows everything there is to know about this. And every piece of this paper that dealt with tax law, he dealt with it. <laughs> so I'm afraid, so I can say to this, there is absolutely a tax play, and this actually can be tax advantageous. I can't explain to you how and why that is. <laughs> <laughs> I can, however, give you a fantastically detailed document that will explain it to you, but not right now. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah. um, does this look the same in the Cambridge-Boston corridor and the Research Triangle? I, I, I'm curious. Sort of what factors can you control for, and what factors can you? Because if they, I mean, if, if it looks the same. Yeah, this is, this is a great question. So, um, so I'm going to use this as a jumping-off point to talk about something that's related, and then circle back to the question you've asked. So, um, up until so up until about 30 years ago, up until 1980, say, it wasn't clear whether Silicon Valley was going to be the tech capital of the United States, or whether the tech capital of the United States was going to be Boston, MIT, that whole complex, right? Believe it or not. Back in 1980, this is actually a battle. They were really close, neck and neck, who was going to go. And as we all know now, it was Silicon Valley, right? Route 148 or 147, whatever the street name they gave it, it never really took off. And interestingly, and this is really kind of cool, a number of legal scholars have argued that the reason why Silicon Valley took off, whereas Boston didn't really succeed as much, is because of California law relating to the enforcement of covenants not to compete. That California does not enforce them, Massachusetts does. So what you had in Silicon Valley was people who were jumping from company to company to company and sharing with them new ideas and new thoughts, new technologies that they'd seen at other places, and you had this sort of synergy that were building, building, building because the whole community benefited. Whereas in Boston, you had all these computer companies where everybody was in lockdown zone. Nobody ever went from company to company. They all stayed at the same place forever and ever. That led to stasis, that led to you know, slow growth, and in the end, again, I'm not saying this is the whole story, but it's part of the story, Boston slowed down and Silicon Valley sped up, and it seems to be at least, at least a little piece of it is attributable to these legal rules that we talked about at the very beginning of the paper. Now, to go back to your question, have Aqua Hires taken off in, Silicon, in Boston and up in this area? Yes, they have, to a, to a certain extent. You'll see Aqua Hires happening to the extent you see startups up there. Although what's happened now, and this just kills the Boston Chamber of Commerce, is that New York has actually surged ahead of Boston when it comes to sort of small media tech internet startups because 
Right now, if you're designing apps for an iPhone, you'd actually would rather be in New York. New York has a whole lot more going on for you. You don't need this huge technological infrastructure around MIT. You just get a couple guys in a, in a basement writing code. So what's happened now is that New York is really the place to be if you want to do this type of deal. You see a lot of Apple hires in New York. You actually see many fewer in Boston. Now, again, this drives Boston crazy, but now they're sort of third in line after Silicon Valley on the one hand and New York on the other. So in that sense, legal rules do matter. I think they do matter. I think they do matter. But I think that, again, I don't want to overstate this. I'm sure that there's lots of reasons why Boston didn't take off. There's lots of reasons why Silicon Valley did. But this, I think, is one of them that explains the rise and fall, but it doesn't necessarily explain the particular transaction structure of the actual hire that I'm looking at. Maybe one or two more questions. Is that mandatory? Yeah. <laughs> Please. No, no. I, I, you know, I have no idea whether any of this is true. Okay. No, it's true. I promise. It's true. I'm not, not, not here. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but if you read the popular press, right, you, uh, right, what you see were essentially threats as between the big players, right? You hire any of our engineers, right, and it's war, mm -hmm. right? We're going to go to war. And so one of the ways to avoid that, right, is to, is to hire them before they're the <laughs> engineers of your uh, yep. competitors, right? And so there's a, there's a strong incentive then to identify the best people before they're working for your competitors and to then keep the, the, the investors, right, the, the VCs, relatively happy, mm -hmm. relatively happy, because they're going to keep funding the people that you're going, they're going to grow the people for you yep. without, uh, you know, Google going to war with Apple. Yep. Right. It's completely right. And it's, what's interesting is that sort of on the topic of <laughs> these companies and hiring, so there have long been allegations, and I think the U.S. You know, Department of Justice has looked into this, that there are antitrust allegations where there's this informal agreement between Google and Apple and several other tech companies that they're not going to hire each other's engineers. So if you want to, if you're Apple, you want to go poach someone from Google, well, there's sort of a gentleman's agreement that you won't do that because then Google might start poaching your guys from Apple. So realistically, <laughs> if you're looking for unaffiliated people you can actually bring in, you're looking for recent grads, or you're looking at the people with these startups and that tends to be where they go. Yeah? Two questions. One. Uh, how do you get interested in Apple hires? Number two, would you be teaching or is there, is there a class in North Carolina that you would be teaching about Apple hiring? Teaching other people who are currently in the business. Yeah, yeah sure. I found out about Apple hiring. There was an article in the New York Times in 2009 where someone mentioned this phrase in passing. Um, my co-author saw it. He brought it to me and said, this is really interesting. We should write about this. And the rest is history. So that was the go New York Times for helping us clue into this topic. Um, in terms of teaching, um, this topic Apple doesn't really fit neatly into any one law school course, right? You can sort of teach it in contracts. It's sort of advanced contracts. It's not really corporations either. Again, it's sort of M and A, if anything. But it's not even really M and A. It might even be sort of employment law. So generally, I teach people about it in these lectures. People come to hear just about Apple hiring. But it's actually very hard to get it into a more classic doctrinal course. Although, of course, I try because you always like to talk about things you're researching in front of your students because. You know, you're excited, they get, hopefully get excited, and you can sort of teach them something they may not otherwise. Well, I want to let's thank John again.